Okay, so in this video we're going to be talking about oriented surfaces and I think this is where most people have a little bit of difficulty trying to understand what's going on but hopefully when I show you how this connects back to regular vector algebra you will have a better understanding of what's going on. So the idea is that you want to have a more general description of the surface. So one way in which you could have that is by having a parametric equation of the surface so just in the same way that we had the, a parametric equation for a curve in three dimensions and that curve was a function of a single parameter t for when it comes to a surface we need to have two parameters and the reason for that is that basically at any point we're going to have derivatives in two directions we're going to have something oriented along the x-axis and something oriented along the y-axis so in this case we need to have two parameters so a general form in which I could write the parametric equation is in terms of a vector um, field. So the vector field here is just going to be described as follows. We're going to have a function of x and y for the x component, y component, and z component. And they're all going to be different. The idea is that once you can find a parametrization for that surface, then what you can do is you can say, okay, so how about we take the derivative of this function oriented along the x direction and the partial derivative of the function oriented along the y direction and then we take the cross product of the two so we want to essentially find a normal vector that is normal to whatever piece of surface we're taking so if we take an infinitesimal chunk of that surface ds and we want to find out what the normal vector is to that surface all we need to do is we take the cross product of those two and we also know that if we take the magnitude of that cross product, not only is that going to give us the length of that new vector, but also it is going to give us the area of that surface. So in essence, we can write the element of surface area in terms of just the regular area via this uh, magnitude of the cross product. Now, you need to notice that I'm using shorthand notation here, so R subscript X means the first partial derivative of R with respect to X, and the same goes for Y, so we have this here. So in essence, the surface area is going to be defined by this integral, or we can rewrite it in longhand notation in this form. So all we need to do is we define a parametric surface that is suitable for the particular problem at hand then we take partial derivatives of that parametric equation with respect to x and y or whatever other variables we may have we take the cross product take the magnitude and then this is the function that we're going to integrate just using a regular double integral so now what we're going to do is the following we're going to have an example in which we're told to find the surface area of a sphere and the sphere here has a radius, uh, constant radius of big R. Now, in order to solve this problem, you know that a sphere looks like this, so it is more convenient to use spherical coordinates. But you notice that normally in spherical coordinates we would have three variables, but in this case R is not changing, R is constant. So what we can do is we can reduce those expressions to functions of two variables in and in essence those two variables, the angle theta, which is the rotation uh, along the z-axis, so if I draw a z-axis here, and then phi, which is a rotation with respect to maybe the y or x, if we represent those two angles as the parameters of this parametric surface, then what we can do is we can write r of theta phi simply as a vector of these three functions. So the first one is going to be r sine phi cosine of theta. Then the second one is going to be r sine phi sine theta. And the last one is r cosine phi. So that is it. That's, that is our parametric surface in this case. And we notice that the element of area so I'm just going to write it here. The element of area with respect to which we're going to integrate, this is just going to be d phi times d theta. Because remember, this is just like a rectangle here, so we're just multiplying those two. Alright, so now the next step is of course finding um, the partial derivative of this, because our goal is to have the cross product 
of those partial derivatives. So the first one we're going to calculate is going to be respect to theta. So that means that we're going to differentiate every single element in here with respect to theta. So this one is going to become minus r sine phi sine theta. This one is going to be r sine phi times sine, actually cosine theta. And the last one is going to be r cosine. Actually, this one is going to be zero because there's no dependency on theta here. So this one is going to be zero. Okay, and now we do the same for the next one. So we're going to differentiate the parametric surface with respect to phi. So now we grab this one, differentiate with respect to phi. So this becomes r cosine of phi cosine of theta. Then this one becomes r cosine of phi sine theta. And the last one is going to be minus r sine of phi. Alright, so now what we can do is take the cross product of those two. So we're going to have cross product of r theta cross with this. And you might wonder, well, is, does it make a difference in which order we do the cross product? Well, we know that the cross product is the same. The only thing that changes is the sign. But remember, from the original equation here, we're only interested in the magnitude of that cross product. So it doesn't matter in which order we perform the calculation because we're taking the absolute value of that, we're always going to get the right answer. So let's do it this way. So the cross product is going to be as follows. We're going to have a 3 by 3 determinant. In this case, we're just going to have i, j, and k. So I'm just going to call them i, j, and k. We have our three components. Now for this one, well, we're going to have... Actually, let's make this a little bit bigger. Because I don't think we're going to be able to fit everything. So this one is going to be minus r sine phi sine theta. Then we're going to have j here. So that's going to be r sine phi cosine of theta and then k over here is going to be zero then for this one we're going to have r cosine phi cosine theta then this one is going to be r cosine phi sine theta and the last one is minus r sine phi okay so now it just becomes a matter of multiplying these ones together. So we're going to have i, so that's the first component here. So we're going to have minus r squared sine squared phi cosine of theta and the next element is just zero. Minus j. Now we're going to have this times that, so that's going to be r squared sine squared phi sine theta and then the next element is zero. And then the last one is going to be this times that, so that becomes minus r squared. Interesting. Sine phi, cosine phi, sine squared theta. Minus, so I'm kind of have to do this down here. r squared, sine phi, cosine phi, cosine squared. theta. So now let's see what we can do. Well, obviously we can rewrite this in shorthand notation. So we're going to have minus r squared sine squared theta phi cosine theta. This one here is going to be minus r squared sine squared phi sine theta. And now in the last one, you notice that we have this term and that term are pretty much the same and we have sine squared cosine squared theta so we can pretty much just extract we can factorize the minus r squared sine phi cosine phi and then this and that are going to give us one so this becomes r squared sine phi cosine phi 
and this is going to be our cross product so now what we want to do is we want to take the absolute value of that so I'm gonna use this notation okay so now we're gonna calculate the magnitude of that vector so let's see what we get well we know we're gonna have the square root so I'm just gonna write it like this so we're gonna have the square root of d squared so that's going to be r to the power of 4 sine 4 phi cosine squared theta this one is going to be plus r to the power of 4 sine 4 phi and then this one is sine squared theta and the last one is going to be r to the power of 4 sine squared phi cosine squared phi so we're gonna take the square root of all that so now let's see if we can regroup terms in any way well here what we have is we have the square root now we have the cosine squared plus the sine squared so this reduces to r to the power 4 sine to the power 4 phi and plus r to the power of 4 sine square phi cosine squared phi so let's see well we could take out we could pretty much because we can factorize r to the power of 4 times sine square phi out of this equation so we would get r squared sine phi and then inside the square root we would be left with essentially sine square phi plus cosine square phi which becomes 1 so in the end we're gonna have r square sine phi and this is basically what we were looking for all along so now you notice that it was a really really long process so but at least now we have exactly what we were looking for so we can go back to the integral so let me just get rid of this here Let's make some room so we can calculate this integral so we found out that this cross product here theta cross phi the magnitude of that is r squared sine phi we know that dA is equal to d phi d theta or it doesn't matter which order and because we have a sphere we have a full sphere right that means that phi theta is gonna go from 0 to 2 pi so it is gonna complete a full revolution and phi is gonna go from 0 to pi because remember that for the angle phi so if we have our set axis aligned there phi is only going to cover half of that because the rotation only needs to happen once along the th um, theta direction so now that we have all that we can finally find the surface area so we can say the surface area of the sphere is going to be equal to this here which is equal to this here da and now we can put in the limit so we have 0 2 pi 0 pi and now we have this expression here r squared sine phi and we have d phi d theta so this is the integral we're going to solve now we know r is a constant so we can take it out here 0 2 pi and now we're going to integrate this function with respect to phi so this is going to become minus cosine of phi from 0 to pi d theta so this is going to be r squared integral from 0 to 2 pi okay so when let's just do it I always like drawing cosine because I know okay so here we have 1 here we have minus 1 at pi so the first one is going to be minus 1 times minus 1, which is just 1. The second one is going to be at 0, so we have 
zero, we have plus one. So we have minus one here. And now the theta, so this becomes two. So this is two R squared. And now we're gonna have theta evaluated from zero to two pi. And then finally, this is going to give us four pi R squared. And this is going to be the total surface area of the entire sphere with radius R. So hopefully this has given you an idea of how you can use oriented surfaces to evaluate surface integrals. And in this case, we show that we can actually perform a parametric representation of spherical coordinates simply by keeping r constant since the sphere ha has a constant radius and then performing the entire procedure which was differentiating the parametric surface with respect to the two parameters theta and phi then taking the cross product and then finally the magnitude of that cross product and this all led us to the following answer so it is a rather long process and surface integrals in general are quite complicated. So do expect to spend a lot of time solving these questions, but at least this should give you an idea of how this works. And in, in later videos, we're going to continue with some more examples just to show you how surface integrals can be used in other ways.